Hi, this is Julie Cooper, a mystery and thriller writer and half of the duo bringing you the podcast series, Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries. We'll get started in just a moment, but first I'd like to give thanks to my brother Chris Squires for his original composition, which is used as our entry and exit music on every episode, and it's his original composition of The Man in the Panama Hat. Our theme for this episode could be called Things That Shape Us. Certainly life experiences shape us, our families and educations shape us, but I'm referring to the power of literature to shape us, to entertain us, and sometimes we look to outstanding fiction to inspire us, and it has the power to challenge us, to show us the dark side of human nature, or even to scare us. That's certainly true in the case of our guest author today. We'll talk about key ingredients for effective suspense, but first, I know Wendy's waiting in the wings, eager to introduce him. Take it. And now the suspense builds, because I'm introducing you to Simon Wood. This is an author who exudes suspense. Just wait and see. Brace yourself when reading his thrillers. Here's an author who slowly peels away the skin over your deepest anxieties as you read every word he's written. It's alarming, yet you're compelled to read more and know more of the story. No wonder he's such a popular, award-winning author. He has more than 150 published stories and articles, earning him the prestigious Anthony Award and a CWA Dagger Award nomination. He has many hair-raising novels. The most recent published is Deceptive Practices. I'm in awe of his writing style. And as a UC Davis alumni, go Aggies! I thank him for giving UC Davis another claim to fame by writing the university into some of his plots. Originally from England, besides being an author, he's a former race car driver, he's a licensed pilot, animal rescuer, endurance cyclist, and occasional private investigator. Welcome, Simon Wood. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we're really excited to have you here, and I'm going to dive right in with some questions because I'm in awe of your villains. <laughs> 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 they are the psychological torture equivalent of the physical torture of the rack during medieval times. These bad guys are so smart, identifying ways to undermine their victims in stages, turning the crank again and again and again, every turn more painful on top of the last. As a reader, I wonder how much can the protagonist mentally take? How do you develop your villains? And how much do you enjoy the way they fulfill their role? <laughs> Um, for me, I think the key thing for when it comes to the villain, to them, they're not the villain. Um, they're the hero of their own stories. Oh, wow. So, it, you know, they're on their own little quest. You know, as far as they know, they're Bilbo Baggins on, on the quest for the ring kind of thing. It's like there's nothing can, wrong with what they're doing. They don't think, oh, I'm a bad guy. Um, it may be that... In some cases, I've got someone who's uh, their worldview is they want to stress test, you know, a person or um, uh, something in the world, and that's their that's what they're trying to do. And in other ones, you know, it's just that they have a problem in life, you know, they have a conflict, and they're solving it the way they think is the right way for them. Unfortunately, they they aren't really aware of the collateral damage they're doing in some in some cases. Wow, that that is a different perspective for me thinking about it. But that does make sense. That after reading Terminated, I looked at my coworkers very differently. Anyone who works with others can identify with this story and really find it a suspenseful thriller. Your protagonist, Gwen does her job, and her co-worker Stephen doesn't like it, and decides to administer his own version of justice. Can you talk a little about plotting the story with motivations that drive one character to be villainous over the same event that another character would just accept in stride? 
Um, I think when I started doing this, I just is the story you know centered on workplace violence, and there was a couple of uh, things that sparked it off. One was my wife's job; um, she inherited someone who had made a a threat against somebody else, and the company was using private security to investigate it. And and it was such a sort of it was done in such a way that made me think this is kind of designed to fail. I know they're trying to do something, but it was them using the private security um, just felt like something would go wrong. And so I started researching um, into workplace violence, and I was quite surprised. It's I think something like. Um, I think it was 20 people a week are murdered in the workplace in the US. Oh, my gosh. Um, And that may be, and that covers everything. Yeah. Um, So it may be the guy in the cube next door to you loses it. Um, It may be someone from the outside attacking a company or an organization. We had that guy who flew his plane into the IRS building a few years ago. We've just had the school teacher um killed by her um husband uh, and killed one of the children in the classroom right. last week yeah. we had um i think it, i can't remember if it was in florida or, or southern california now you had the guy who was um fired from the gym who came back and killed one person in the gym and these are just in the last week or so wow um i mean you can argue that the san bernardino i have a sort of slightly different look on that 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 was a the, the the husband and wife who came in and shot up um, the place in San Bernardino that was their ex employees or their ex co workers yeah uh, yes and I feel that was more to do with um, that issue than than pinning the label on saying it was a terrorist thing that that just smacked of everything people looking for an outlet for a frustration and using that seemed like cover. Or justification. You've got mm-hmm. to be able to, you know, you got screwed over. How can I justify it? I say I'm part of a cause. Ah. No wonder uh, this book really strikes a chord when you're reading it. But the other thing was I asked, I, I actually asked a lot of people on Facebook and things and said, have you had anything weird happen? And so the little, the little side stories are kind of... Um, pinched from other people's actual experiences. Oh, interesting. Uh, so the guy who went around to look, you know, looking in people's desks and finding little bits of information on everybody. <laughs> uh, that was that was based on um, someone that my wife worked in, worked wow. with years ago. Yeah, who did that? Who just liked the power trip of being able to drop something in conversation. Wow. Oh, like, that's scary. <laughs> and again, it's just, it's something extremely small. It's not exactly a crime, but it is something where you you make people shift in their seat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was basically gathering information f- for that. You know, I gathered all these different, like, case studies and just thought, well, and there was always a thing, there's a tends to be a theme is it's not necessarily always um a big thing that starts this off it's always the little drip 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 of that that joke that went too far once and keeps being reused again and again um you know it's that thing of someone is their life is falling apart and the and the only thing that's keeping them together is say their job and when that goes away then they're floundering they want to strike back and it was just always interesting to look at the the motivations take a step back from what the violent act was and look at what were the circumstances leading up to it um sort of like hitchcock is very much my spirit animal (laughs) when it comes to writing books and things and i kind of like play off of that thing there's no drama in the explosion it's what leads up to it and so, you know, it was just, you know, I wanted to create um, um, a scenario for this guy um, who's the villain. And I, you know, it's like, OK, this guy isn't the most stable of people in the first place. And it comes down to how well do you know the person next door to you? You kind of assume they're in the same sort of um, 
level as you and then you kind of chip away and find that they're not and when they're challenged out comes their insecurities and their issues but also i wanted to go back and see that he was kind of manufactured by life circumstances at the same time i wanted to do that with gwen i tend to like do mirror image characters in that you've got a villain doing his thing but you'll find that the hero of the story has also had similar challenges uh but they cope with the situation in different ways Oh, but, you know, you, you know, you've got true. these two people on a collision course. You know, you can have two uh, you can have two people and the problem can be money. One will go and get a loan from the bank. The other one will rob it. <laughs> That's true. It's, it's just, you know, and you just create the flashpoint between these two people where they'll intersect one day. And, you know, the, the course of events will never be the same. Yeah, I think reading it, too, as you're talking, I I can see how as a reader, that was what was part of what was building this intense suspense for me, is that I could see that collision course coming, (laughs) but I didn't know exactly how or when or where that was going to happen. And and then the ways that it does are just so intriguing. Like you say, you know, they... You don't know the person next to you. You think that they're just normal. And then, um, you know, then you start sensing, no, there's something different here. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's a thing of people are unpredictable. Yes. But also at the same time is I, I think anybody who says they could never cross a line, I think that, you know, if you put enough pressure points on someone and take away... Um, a lot of their options you know everybody's three or four bad decisions away from going into a bank with a sawn off shotgun and saying reach for the sky I, I don't think anybody can say I would never do that you just don't know how life is going to squeeze you yeah well later in Terminated Gwen has been attacked and hurt by Stephen repeatedly and on so many levels. And psychologically, she's lost confidence in her own thoughts and actions. At one point, she's so frustrated and upset that she strikes out uncharacteristically. Can you talk about the theory that readers don't want to see their heroes triumph in the end by acting as badly as the bad guy? The idea that that, that makes that makes us as bad as them do they have to find another way to win um i think you you end up going through the gambit i think the character has to go through the the gambit of decisions um bad ones as well and i and again you know what steven does to her is basically do what he feels is being done to him yeah. Which is, you know, life's options are being taken away. The normal avenues of um, resolution are taken away. Um, you know, it's the fact that, you know, she's relied on the police. She's ri- relied on a, a private security company. And they basically get to the point where they no longer trust or believe her. So there's a point where it's like, well, I'm going to have to do this myself or just surrender. Yeah. Um, and that was it. It was just pulling pulling the legs off of you know uh gwen as it were until you know it was she's gonna basically say well i'm gonna cross the line as well if no one's gonna help me and this guy can do it why can't i yeah and i think that's a very genuine kind of thing but it is that kind of thing that when you're designing characters as it were you um you want your heroes to buckle not necessarily you know break but you know you take them all the way there um, and, uh, you know, because you don't want the person who becomes as bad. I think it's, you know, it's an even finer line when you're playing with anti-heroes. Is that you, your, your anti-heroes um, set of ethics and code can't be as bad as the guy who's the villain of the piece. But um, I, I think it would be disingenuous for... Uh, a character, say, like in Gwen's position or, or in many of the stories that I write, not to explore them or even pursue them to a certain extent. Switching to a workshop that you have plotting your novel, it sounds like it's very practical information for writers. And, and 
done in a process that isn't creativity killing. With that in mind, can you discuss plotting the give and take between a character's self-determining their own future versus fate deciding their future? Um, I kind of always do this thing of that you have internal issues and you have external pressures kind of thing is that the world around you can have an impact because it's that thing of um, if you see two guys running down the street, one's being chased by the other, the outside viewer who's not part of the story is going to make a determination who's the good guy, who's the bad guy and tackle one potentially. But they may make the wrong decision. So it's that thing that you get the added complication of the um, the outside world having an impact on what is essentially, you know, I tend to have very a very small cast of characters who are in conflict, but I like to open it up and show the um, the outside world having an impact on it as well. Because, you know, they're trying to have their own little private battle in a in people going around their day-to-day business. So it is something to sometimes just think outside of um, the story and think about how it's being perceived um, externally. Does that answer your question? It really does. And as I think back on your books that I've read, it, it, re- it e- explains how realistic they feel as you're reading them. They really feel like real life. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm a big sort of like consumer of uh, of the of thrillers as well so you kind of look and you kind of have a little bit of a uh, an eye to sort of like how are other people doing it and i always think of my favorite one because it is such a mean-spirited story plot is the other is the opening of demolition angel where the earth you know they're diffusing a bomb the la bomb disposal people and as they're diffusing a bomb they're just about to get there there's an earthquake oh wow and that's a perfect example of uh, you know you can't you know the characters can't deter you know don't have control over everything wow that's a great example and that i just love that because that is such a mean a uh, piece of story. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sort of like going, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> well, turning to something that's uh, fun, on your Simon Wood web hideout, which I really recommend to our listeners, simonwood.net, that um, you mentioned that you cured your fears of heights by becoming a licensed pilot. Wow. Do you demand that kind of courage from your characters? And and what do you demand from your heroes? Um, I think a lot of it is, part of the stuff is I have a small talent for disaster myself. So a lot of these things are very much first-hand stories, amplified in a lot of ways. And I just have this thing of, I think I'm too literal as a person. And so when someone says conflict in the story, then I'll take it all the way to its <laughs> illogical um, conclusions. And it was just a thing that I, ha- I, I liked planes and I liked fast cars and things, but I just took a flight once that was really, it wasn't bad, but I just got spooked on it, a uh, commercial flight. And then after that, I just didn't like heights. Yeah. And I just did flying and it was I won't say it cured me, but it is that thing of um of going going through it and having and it's worse. And once you're in a plane and certain things happen in the air and it's like everybody in the plane is completely unaware of what is probably going on frantically in a in the cockpit. Wow. Um, Because I've sometimes been on the plane and think, we are so close to stalling right now. Um, And everybody's completely blissfully unaware, except probably me and anybody else who's got any flying experience. I've I've had a few couple of scary flights that have been sort of like, you know, the passengers are unaware that there's got to be something going wrong right now. Blissfully ignorant, Uh, that would describe me. (laughs) Well, um, tell me a little, this is just kind of a fun question, but how is writing like race car driving, or is writing more like endurance bicycling? 
Um, I think racing. I think the the thing when I was racing and thinking about writing is both of them just take an awful lot of determination because there's going to be a there's a lot of no involved. Um, you know, I always thought I always to be personally. To be perfectly honest, I think race car driving made me a much stronger person. As much as I knew I was never going to be successful enough to um, do it long term, um, it certainly gave me a lot of resilience and uh, personal sort of inner strength to do other things. But that was something where the odds are against you of a success, even just, you know mate doing a race you know the cars are complicated the cars are expensive you're relying on the ability to be able to actually get in that car and make it perform reasonably um sometimes the seat belt was to keep me in the car not to save my life sometimes <laughs> you just want to get out wow. and run away it's just too spooky and you know there was just a um but there was a, a much overriding thing for me is I want to do this. I want to race cars. I want to do this. And I'm going to basically ignore all de- detractors. I'm going to learn about this sport and I'm going to do it. And I think that carried into writing. Uh, my background is engineering. Um, I'm dyslexic. I I don't have a degree or anything. I never studied um, uh creative writing beyond um high school classes normal high school classes and stuff um but i suddenly had it in my head i want to do this and i'm gonna um and it's gonna get done i don't think i don't don't say it from the point of view that i was convinced that i was going to get published but i went into this with the intention that um there will be nothing left on the table i put everything into this and if it went nowhere fine um but i'm i'm actually going for this and i think that's the biggest parallel is just uh the determination in in both are exactly the same oh that's really inspiring i love that in what ways does your experience as an occasional private investigator pop up in your writing um i know that my agent and a couple other people actually want me to write about um my wife and I, we used to work as a, uh, a a double act as PIs. We used to go undercover in casinos and things. And and I think a lot of that was, our jobs was to go undercover for two or three days and we would have like four or five assignments, uh, catch this guy stealing from the register. This person is taking bribes, bri- try and bribe them. And so there was an ability to be able to um, change hats quickly from our point of view and to be able to work um, off the cuff oh, yeah. a lot of the way. A lot of times um, the other side of that is there was an awful lot of people watching, Yeah, which was always handy, um, especially in a casino kind of environment. Um, you, it was just a very sort of um, fun way to watch people whether it's to watch someone losing big or someone winning big someone being tempted by the casino to do something um, I think one of the first ones I ever saw was I think I was in Tahoe in a casino and um, was watching uh, a bride still in a you know in a um, gown having a meltdown because her husband on the wedding day had blown all the money. <gasps> oh, wow. Oh. Um, oh. On the day in the oh. casino. Oh, no. and, it, and he's still in the, in the mor- you know, the tux and the morning dress sort of thing, um, the suit. Oh, no. And, and you know, she's like going, uh, you know, I'm going to get my dad, you know, how much money. And it's like, you know, like, so you're watching the soap opera carry on yeah. by the machines kind of thing but you know the other thing was i we did indian casinos as well as vegas casinos and being in that one of where the casino is local and this isn't in an indictment on casinos i actually quite like casinos but i'm one of those people i come in with the money in my pocket if i leave with none of it 
then that was the price of admission for me. Yeah. And it's that thing you can't get angry about losing it or whatever. But it was sort of like watching people who would come in with the paycheck on a Friday, cash it in the um, in the cage, then sort of come out, play, lose it, then start taking loans from the casino. Ugh. And that was rough. Yeah. You're watching someone and you're literally thinking... Uh, no, you know, like when you want to cut someone off with like a, you know, you've drunk too much, yeah. you want to go and go, you've gambled too much. But, um, you know, it was a weird thing to watch. You, you'll watch like the really high rollers who will, will be at the table 24 hours at a go. Yeah, it's because re- I've seen people, you know, I've gone to bed at like two, I'll get up at eight and they're still there. Oh my gosh. And they, they were there yesterday. And, you know, the, and they're, they're spending big money. You know, it's people losing and winning millions at tables over that sort of time period. And then you you see, it, you know, the same thing carry out on penny slots. Oh, you're getting some real human raw emotion. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and so, you know, it's that thing. And even if you're watching someone who's, like you say, stealing from the register, you're walking, you know, sometimes you might see something really inventive. Yeah. <laughs> what they're doing. Something that you have to sort of admire somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the worst part of it is because we have to document everything by the minute. Oh, you yeah. Know, who oh, was there, my. Who was there? Who bought a drink? Who was sitting next to you? Who was sitting to the right of you? Um, you know, and you're, you know, in a, in a Vegas casino, they change out dealers every hour. In an Indian casino, it's like it was some of them. It's every fifteen minutes, so you've got to record a crew change in your head. Oh wow! And hold that information. So that was another thing is that you end up. And me and my wife used to divide, uh, divide and conquer. Um, she would re- keep times um, in her head. I would keep names and descriptions. Yeah. And then you're doing that thing of you look like you have a bladder condition because you're running into the bathroom, <laughs> writing it down. You're writing it down so you can info dump that information, forget all about it, come out and start recording again. Because you may be expected to be at a table for an hour, two hours. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it seems that you love writing horror stories as much as crime stories. Your books, The Scrubs and Road Rash, are written with the pen name Simon Janus. What's the strongest appeal in writing horror stories for you? Um, I think a lot of it is I tend to, they say write what you know, I tend to write what I love. And I just grew up on sort of like black and white movies of that were about horror and crime. <laughs> and so there is that thing of just ha- um, through that sort of like years and years of whether it was, um, you know, these old sort of like noir films or whether it was the monster movie of the week, you kind of just pick up something that is, I now have a, a, a view of what would make a good horror story or a good crime story to me. Something that, hasn't been told or something that is i love this when i was a kid and i want to put my spin on this sort of situation oh yeah uh, i can so, see that you know, you know i i love my favorite horror writer is james herbert who's an english writer and he used to write these books every year and i couldn't afford to buy the hardbacks when i was little so i was getting the the paperback and waiting a year for the paperback <laughs> um, and I just loved his style. He was a very straightforward writer. And to sort of like come back to one of your earlier points, you know, his story would be like the rats, the fog, the dark were like the titles of his book. And so, you know, his antagonist was usually a thing that couldn't communicate. So he would use the outside observer. So you'd have these little vignettes throughout the story who were prote- who were basically red shirt characters who were going to die but you'd have the main hero doing his thing but to illustrate how this is having an impact on you know a town a country um is you would see you know such and such character being affected by whatever the the monster creature was and seeing them succumb to it to make you aware of what the stakes were and i always loved that because that was very much you know 
his sort of style, especially through the 70s and 80s, that you kind of went, oh, that, I'd love to be able to do that. Oh. Is to, you know, is that have these third person characters who, you know, give you a sort of like the the shape of this, you know, this of this sort of drama from a, you know, a third party point of view. From their perspective. I like that. I'm going to have to check into those books. That's that. I'd like to read some of that. Well, I have to ask you about your chilling book, The One That Got Away, which is another of your works that really got under my skin. When reading your books, I just get obsessed with them. And in this case, the psychological torment uh, partially is actually self-inflicted by your protagonist, Zoe. She's suffering from the guilt of being a survivor. Zoe and her friend Holly were captured by a sadistic killer, and Zoe escaped without Holly. Can you talk about the challenges of portraying survivor guilt and the feeling that there's no escape from it in this story? Um, yeah, I, there was just something in my head. I usually am very topic-driven. I want to explore a topic, and I wanted to look at survivor guilt. And oddly enough... I had had a, I, I've had several head injuries, so that usually means a lot of uh, psychoanalysis to make sure um, that I don't have continuing problems. Because I have short-term memory loss, I have had amnesia and stuff like this from from head injuries. So I had just said, I have this idea for um, about survivor guilt, and I spoke to the psychologist I was dealing with, and I said, who do I talk to? And they said, go to the VA. Mm -hmm. And they set me up with a VA psychologist. And we spent um, probably a couple of days just in a room talking. And I usually come in with my story idea. Like, I like to do first-hand interviews with whatever people are sort of like, I'm trying to portray. Uh huh. And, um, and so I went in and said, this is my story. And he said, well, let me stop you there and tell you how it really is. Wow. And I usually end up throwing out my skeleton plot and usually uh, just sit and talk. And I'd had some, an incident in my life and I sort of talked about that. And then he said, well, what did you do afterwards? And we kind of got into it and we kind of got into my own PTSD experiences. And, but, I want it with everything I try and do is I have to, I have to have an extra level of cruelty to the story. So when I wanted Holly, the first thing I, I had put in my head was for this character is that, OK, she escapes a, a terrible trauma. But to make it worse, it was at the expense of leaving her friend. Right. Which d just doubles down on... Um, on the sort of PTSD side of it. And it was just interesting once we started talking about what was the behavior and one was, uh, you know, you get people who become, um, there's a certain level of arrogance of like, well, you have no idea. Your little world is lovely. Mine is a mess because I did this or I, I experienced this. And so they become very, you know, they're putting barriers between them and loved ones, friends, and just everybody in general. There's also a desire to self-destruct, which is to revisit the the trauma. And that might be uh, very directly or that may be indirectly. Um, whereas you kind of see that with, with Zoe, um, one basically scrapping her life role and basically putting herself in danger by being one a mall cop and two by basically going out being somewhat um provocative um in clubs and bars to see if she'll meet someone like the tally man again yeah because there's a desire to get a do-over but there's the sort of like cognitive dissidence of i want the do-over but i want to lose yeah and yeah. so there's there's this always this this total push pull with um, the thing of of not really you know of it always comes into this thing of like um, I got into this thing of magical thinking. It was like if I had done this, everything would have been different on that day. Yeah, that and, and what if kind of, 
Yeah, and it's that thing of like we can never go back to that. So there's kind of this thing of uh, simulation upon simulation and being unhappy with the results regardless of what they are. And so you've got someone who is, in Zoe's case, is very sort of like self-destructive um, uh, in so many different ways, but also there's no direction for her. You know, she's striking out of the world in so many different directions uh, until she gets, you know, until there's a murder that kind of looks similar to um, what happened to her. And the title is somewhat vague for me. Is It's not that, you know, to the tally man, she's the one that got away, but also to Zoe, uh, the tally man is someone who got away from her. She's oh, got unfinished business. I never thought so, of that twist. That that's so, excellent. So reencountering him or thinking she's reencountering him is for her the one thing that gives her direction for once in her life. I love that. I never thought of that twist with the title. That's perfect. Wow, that's really good. Clever. In the one that got away, the physical terror is coming from a sadistic serial killer. What do you have to keep in mind when you're writing about the motives and actions of a serial killer? Is it different? You know what? I'll be honest. I kind of got caught. I've written two books about serial killers. I've never thought of them as serial killers. Oh, okay. And I think that kind of helps. I I did one, one of my, my book, No Show, is about, about uh, no is about a serial killer who goes after whistleblowers. Oh. And <laughs> that sounds good. I got to read that now. <laughs> and I kind of went it was literally about 6 months after the book came out and I kind of went, "Oh yeah, it's I suppose it is about serial killers." But I never in my mind ever really set him up as that. It kind of was because he was basically killing, you know, similar victims. And the same with um the one that got away is that I wanted this person who's essentially just on this quest to cure bad behavior. Yes. And you kind of get the insight of, and it's not bad behavior from the point of view of a major crime because in, in his mind that, you know, cr there are certain crimes that get dealt with in, you know, penal codes and all this sort of stuff. And there are laws against but there's all the little crimes that people kind of have no interest in ever seeing resolved. Yeah. And, and it was that kind of thing. And it came from comments of just people I know, which is, you know what should be a, you know what should be a capital crime? Jaywalking. And you kind of like play on that in your head and say, what if someone took that kind of not jaywalking i mean it's not that was not his mo but it was that thing of like well what if it is that thing of like someone thinks he has to be judge jury and execution again he's not being a villain he's ridding society on and teaching society a lesson yeah about what it is to be a responsible um human being or a responsible member of society so again you know it's not he's a villain he's doing he's doing a public service in his head <laughs> and again you kind of peel it back and you kind of see where that that thinking comes from yeah it, is that his growing up is to deal with punishment over punishment of of misdemeanors yeah and the dogs in that book, <laughs> you were killing me with the dog from the dog saving place and the killer identifying with that dog and his life. And you almost get me forgetting about the villain's brutality. And you do get me to feel sympathy for him along with the dog. And, and also you get that sympathetic reaction from me but in a different way through a different way in terminated also like it's not his fault he has problems and then i catch myself in the next scene when he brutally murders somebody no he's evil oh my gosh how are you skillfully getting me between brutal scenes to feel like he's not such a bad guy he just has problems <laughs> um i just think You've got to have a little sympathy for the devil. You don't have to say um, they aren't 
you know, you should give them a hug and tell them it's okay and, and forgive them for that. But I think there is a little bit, and I think it came from my, one of my first books, and it was somebody said, I have no time for somebody who does this. And I thought, well, you can't be that black and white because you may be that person who does that one day. Yeah. Because it's not out. It wasn't. It wasn't something as as harsh as murder or rape or anything like. It right. was. It was about infidelity. It was someone at a, a book sign and said, "I have no sympathy for um, uh, anyone who cheats." And I kind of went, "Well, you never know. You may be the one who cheats." Yeah. You can't make a blanket statement for that. And I. And it's just the thing. Also, is that any villain isn't mis, you know moustache twirling from birth definitely you know everybody is born um i like to, i think there may be s- some people who aren't who you know all their circuits are right but essentially everybody is a product of their environment and and so there is that thing of like you kind of need to understand because it can't be that sort of thing of when it comes to a bad you know the baddie in a book or whether it's in real life is that thing of like it's not without you know you can't be that sort of black and white about it and be um i have no time for this kind of person we need to punish them to the worst thing is is um you you've got to have some sort of empathy you don't have to forgive but i don't think you can you can't be without empathy your your characters definitely bring that out with with the reader. Your your thrillers are true page turners. I mean, I just love your stories and I can't put them down until I'm forced to and then I can't wait to pick them up again. That's what I mean about your stories getting under my skin. What is it about your writing that makes it so reader obsessive? Um I think I one is like if you go back to the plotting thing, I am someone who my my job was designing safety equipment for oil rigs. That was what my first sort of grown up job was, and so for me, it's that thing of thinking around the corners and and what is the most? How can something go wrong ten different ways from Sunday? But my job was was to have to think around that and solve those problems. And so I've kind of applied that to writing and I just basically is in my head to stay on point on what are the issues in the story. I tend not to be, uh, I tend not to ever have sort of like side trips and things like this on the, on the story. It's always on point. And so I never, I think it's the Elmore Leonard thing. I cut out all the bits that people skip over. <laughs> You definitely and, do. <laughs> and so it's that thing of just keeping it in the moment. That's why I think the stories take place over, usually take place over a very short period of time in the book because I don't want someone, you know, if you if if something gets to, if I don't want to be there, I don't never really want a moment's peace yeah. for anybody, and so it has to be compressed. You you know, you put the time constraints on, you keep the story over maybe just a few days and um but it's going to seem like a very long few days for the reader but essentially these things tend to take place over a working week most times oh that's that's good advice for writing your struggle with dyslexia is also inspiring do you have any advice for people who find obstacles to their dreams? How they should not give, how do they not give up whatever their dreams might be? You know, not necessarily writing, but how did, what's it, what advice do you have for people that are encountering obstacles to their dreams? I, I just always take the, the, the thing of like, no is never the answer. Someone says you can't do it. And it's like, well, well, let's have a go. Let's see what we can do. I've never, I, I don't know, I'm not a very confident person, but I am a very determined person. I just don't know whether I'll pull it off, but I'm going to try until I can't do it. And I think that goes for anything. It's, you know, it's that thing of like, if you're not tall enough to do something, reach something in the in your room, you get as, you know, a step stool. There is always a um, a way of beating this. 
oh, that's, of getting around of an, an issue. That's a good way to put it. Julie, do you have some questions for Simon too? Yes, I do. I have a few shorter questions. Um, Simon, you've written about, as Wendy mentioned, some formidable, formidable antagonists, especially the one in Terminator, which really stood out for me. And for me specifically, it brought back some truly unpleasant memories of a very toxic work environment once upon a time where everyone was looking over their shoulders. Do you pull anything from real life experiences working with with others in companies and on teams in in terms of building these characters um yes like i say a lot of the stuff that you get in um the books are based on first-hand experience and and certainly with terminate i think everybody had a story that you could i could relate to um i worked next to a company once where um, there was obviously a problem, and we knew that when a ch- an office chair went out the window. Um, Whoa! Oh! Of- <laughs> and and obviously he didn't take the firing particularly well. But the interesting <laughs> thing was, um, the interesting thing from that was um, was like the week later. Um, at the time when I was, this was in the oil industry stuff, we used to have to worry about liquidated damages. So my working day was from like 8 till midnight during the week. Um, we worked around the clock because we had to get it done by a certain date regardless. Sure. So we'd sometimes maybe at work from 8 in the morning, sometimes it's about 4 or 5 in the morning. And with a couple of like, you know, hour breaks. But because wow. we worked late, we saw the sort of like the office thing and we were sort of like working and then uh the guy came back with his car and he drove through the front of the building oh and we we were just leaning out the window (laughs) calling you know 999 and said um (laughs) we've just seen a guy drive through the front of you know business x and i said you may want to speak to them i know they just fired a guy recently (laughs) um (laughs) And so you you get to witness that, um, and you just kind of play. And I've just been in offices with, um, a, I had a really oppressive boss once. Um, I, I've had unstable kind of office mates, and sometimes it's never directed at a person. But to be around someone who is explosive and volatile is enough to unsettle a, a room. Um, Hmm. And sometimes with my school, my high school was somewhat, um, spe- I don't know what it was, maybe it's just it was just the era, I kind of went into high school, uh, the sort of like 1980 was when I went to high school, and obviously that's kind of a recession time, kind of a, and I just remember the, the amount of physical violence between teachers and, and kids, and I'm not just on about corporal punishment, you know, kids you know really getting into big fights with teachers uh gangs in schools not in a sort of like heavy way but certainly in enough that it was oh this is like a prison yard thing you've got, you've got one group over here one group over there and you and the idea of going to high school at like at 12 in in england and suddenly seeing maybe 60 70 people in a brawl and thinking, I am 12 years old, I am very, very small, <laughs> and trying to <laughs> navigate that. And also, like, seeing desks and chairs fly out of a, a an upper floor window. Mm. And you just kind of, that sort of thing of, I think certainly there was, there's kind of that, um, that thing of being in my head, certainly my first year or two in high school, of, of actually being very nervous mm-hmm. of because it was such a volatile um, school environment um, until I think sort of better times in the country happened and kids sort of like graduated out of the system that um, there was less of that. Um, but there wasn't without its high points and low points um, of kids who were violent, who came from um, maybe some sort of like... Uh, dangerous sort of like home lives and things like that and then bringing it into sure, school sure um okay so yeah i i 
you know, it is a, everything I think is for me is amplifying something that that's happened to me. Right. Um, in one way or another, like no shows based on my first day in the U.S. Um, Terminate is based it on based on my wife's job. My A.D. Westlake books are actually based on real incidents that I experienced in the motor racing world, and so you just kind of build fictions around them. Makes perfect sense. Well, I know you've talked a little bit about one of the key ingredients in a a villain or an antagonist is is the ability for the reader to feel empathy, a little bit of empathy, or at least understanding of how they sort of got that way. But are there other tips you would offer to to writers about how to build the best possible bad guy or girl you can develop as a writer? Um, yeah, uh, my big thing is treat them like the hero, because they are they're doing the right thing in their head. In their mind, yes, truly. Um, okay. There's the upside, of it, but to be honest, everybody is a is a reflection of me. All the characters are based on me. <laughs> is there's a lot of me just sitting around and and so sort of like going, if I'm this guy, or if I'm this woman in this position, how am I going to act? And so I tend to write PO, you know, switching POVs and things. And there is kind of thing of like, this is going to be a Gary day <laughs> um, because you're going to be, you know, writing in that frame of mind for a while and then switching over to somebody else the following day. Ah, um, okay. Because it is that thing of like, I, I don't, I, I'm just very, uh, in, I don't know, I think I'm very obsessed when I'm sort of like writing that sort of thing of whether it's a good person, a bad person, a side character or not, is that thing of just being very sort of like dialed into who they are. And, and basically if, if I have, if I'm in that situation, how am I going to act rather than divorcing yourself and like moving a character around like it's a chess piece? Well, I'm not like this. So mm-hmm. I'm going to write about them. I think if you write, so I tend to, I think everything that I tend to write is very immediate because it's always in the moment I tend to basically delete everything where I've got to stop and explain so everything is very much you see it happen right and that comes and through very that, clearly yes and I think that's why there is that thing of you come back to it because I'm not going to stop and explain uh, what's going on it's going to be demonstrated to you um, and I think certainly when you get to the climax it all becomes very tunnel vision if you're running for your life, and I've just had some very near-death experiences, um, which uh, from various things is kind of that thing of like if you're having, if you're in fear for your life or something like that, the last thing you do is that. Well, this reminds me of that time when I was nine. <laughs> is is right. there's none right. of that. It all becomes not time very, for a flashback to childhood. No, yeah. it all becomes very primal, and it's that thing of like um, I'm going to live today, and that is basically the only thing that is in somebody's head. Um, right. I had to I had to crash land a plane when I was a student, and that oh. was the only thing going through my head is that part of me said, "Oh, I do just want to, I want to make this go away. I want to make this pain and agony of being lost, being in bad weather, being that the air traffic can't help me, and saying I might as well just nosedive this in the ground and get it over and done with." Whoa. But there's kind of a uh, a self-preservation thing that all you're thinking of is I, I you know I don't want to die today I don't want to die today and that is the only you know that's the only thought there's nothing else yeah and um, and so that that plays into it and I think that's why I tend to write very much in the moment because I think it really? is more realistic to a certain extent well I think it gives your writing great focus truly and I think it gives and- it energy and energy certainly, and momentum. Um, and speaking of momentum, I know you've you've taught some online programs about plotting, which Wendy mentioned earlier. And I know you've just done one, I think, recently for Sisters in Crime. But can you share with our listeners one or two key tactics about keeping the action moving forward? Um, I always. And I think put- you've touched on that already, but. Well, the thing that I always do, whether it's every scene or every chapter, whatever way you like to write, is basically something should have happened. It should have moved on from um, 
one scene to the other. I think I think the interesting thing when I did the class recently with sisters was everybody would like because what I do is I get everybody to break their book down by bullet point. Is there's a one sentence for every scene, mm-hmm. and people were writing things like, um, and essentially when you sat down, it's like all we uh, that happened was someone entered a room, and you described the room, and we left. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and that's the chapter. There's nothing else in it. And that's and it's the that, book the reader stops reading, right? <laughs> oh, it's the thing that slows the momentum down. And it's like, yes. okay, we're going to go into this room and something's going to happen. We can't just have a thing that we come in and we go. I, my worst my worst thing with people is, it's like, um, you have to show me their job on the move is that whatever we opened at the chapter was we close in the chapter with we we progress and i always think raiders of lost ark is probably the best teaching tool out there is that story doesn't stop hmm, is true. that even the thing of even the thing of getting in a plane has a purpose yeah that's right is that right. there's no downtime in the story of like saying we're going to we're going to have some glory shots of um you know, the view of the world, you know, <laughs> the environment, you know, we're going to have these, you know, master shots that are going to set up the location. They need to be done in one or two seconds. So my thing with when we do these classes is, is like, okay, you have them enter the room. Is there going to, we need a body to hit the floor. We need a fight to bring, break out. We need a conflict. There needs to be a conflict in every scene. And it's going to be not resolved or resolved. That's all it is. And it's going to push us on to the next place. We can't have this thing of we just sit around and it's like, well, uh, people just read a newspaper. When we break down the scene, <laughs> that was essentially it. someone came in and bought a half a pound of ham and left. Uh, it's, that's not a chapter. We didn't, it's not. We didn't move the story on to the next stage. Very good point. Which, talking about moving to the next stage brings me to my next question. Um, knowing that you love teaching about plotting, are you kind of a, a master outliner, a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants writer, or a hybrid, a combination of all of those? Um, my thing is, I'm not a big per. I am a detailed person, but I don't like making a lot of detailed notes. Okay. So I have this... I developed this spreadsheet. This is my engineering side of just... And it's color-coded. And I just put down what's going to happen in each scene is that it's going to be... Um, so if you take uh, Terminator that you talked about, is like I would write down opening scene, is all that's written down is Gwen gives Stephen his evaluation, and it goes bad. <laughs> um, second Truly. scene is they kind of, you know, she basically thinks it's over and tells you know, human resources is over that she's gave him the bad news and then he basically puts a knife to her and tells her to change her review. Right, out in the that, parking lot. That's, that's yes. it. And then it's like and I just basically write that down. You know, it is the thing of like you know, scene three is her reflecting on what just happened. Does she do it? Does she not do what he tells her? It reminds her of what happened. She basically goes home and tells her husband and you know and that and i'm just doing just these one-liners of what the these things are okay good and because for me it's very easy to then look at that and if i color code it by main plot subplot uh, point of view character is that then i can move things around try and blend things and i'm not lost in all the detail Mm-hmm. And then I'll have maps and calendars and I'll write down when everything happens um, so that, you know, I don't have a nine-day week uh, or anything weird like that. Or even exactly. look for holidays. Mm-hmm. You know, you go back to your earlier point about uh, external influences is you kind of like doing it. You're doing it in May and you realize, hey, I just realized I've gone straight through uh, Memorial Day. Either move the story out of that or incorporate Memorial Day somehow in the story, how that can impact it. Sure. Okay. And yeah. so, yeah, it's all very, just very bullet pointy, but it is a sort of skeleton of, um, of what I need to know. And then all I do is basically 
make it up on the day is that I'll ponder, you know, the scene where the bad review scene in Terminator. I'll like think about that and then just sit down the following day and write that. And the color that and the shape that comes with that sort of is is born out of the moment. And then I change. I can change the little spreadsheet as I go, as as things develop. Great. Well, I know you've said, and we thank you again for joining us on this podcast, but you've said you're in the midst of deadline hell. And so I'm wondering if you could tell us what's next in terms of your writing projects. Um, the next thing is um, a follow-up to Pay and the Piper. Um, it's been something that's been in my head for a while uh, as a follow-up story for the, the, the FBI and the reporter character in that, in that book. So they, they're going on a different kidnapping story. Um, they're following in that, so that'll be out, I think, next year. And oh, then, good. and the book after that is called "The Never Was Man," which is inspired by a couple of things. One is my own amnesia after a head head in, a head injury, um, and trying to rebuild my memory, and being slightly spooked by the fact that because I couldn't remember things, and you try and do that, go down memory lane and meeting people who said you were here on a Thursday and we did this and you kind of start convincing yourself yes I did Mm. and I was talked about this years ago and I had a psychologist say that's called manufactured memory right and I thought oh that's an interesting idea and it's what if you program someone with manufactured memory because of an incident and it's also inspired by uh, a uh, Jim Jones documentary that I watched uh, and it was not about Jim Jones it was about the the few people who who basically didn't drink the Kool-Aid and kind of left ah. and escaped from Jonestown and that was fascinating because you got people you know what nearly 40 years later who can't think about that without breaking down wow and, I wanted to sort of blend that in a um, that kind of thing of people somebody who's witnessed a trauma um, and now their memory's been essentially rewritten for them oh that sounds sounds really good (laughs) terrifying combination truly Uh, any favorite writing book recommendations that you'd you'd proudly recommend to yeah I wanted to go because of I, the topic you chose, I wanted to show a book which is one of those books. I have books where I go, God, I wish I'd written that. <laughs> um, yeah. And one that I have from a few years ago because it's it's such a mean book um, to the reader, I think, because it takes conflict to another level. And that's Velocity by uh, Dean Koontz. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> And that takes the idea... I think I'm always very much dilemma-driven in the stories is that my characters have to make a decision and whether, you know, it goes back to your early point, do they cross a line or not? Sure. Um, in Velocity, it was it was a bartender who's got... Um, who's had trauma in his life and then someone comes in and leaves a note for him and says, you have to make a choice. I am going to kill either... A young school teacher um, who's never done anything wrong. She's in the beginning of her life. She's going to make, you know, a life for her. And it says, or I will kill an elderly woman who uh, who does charity work. And he goes, make a decision. Who are you going to save? Because I'm killing one. And there's just that horrible thing because someone's going to. There's no right answer. You know, and basically, um, this killer is taunting this bartender to sort of make these impossible choices. So he's mm-hmm. trying to save both people at once. Ah, and okay. So he's sort that, of playing God. Yeah. Yeah. So it's that thing of like, I want you know, he's forcing the bartender to play God, and he doesn't want to do that. He's trying to save both you know all the people because it's not just one pair of people he keeps receiving these challenges of i've got two equally decent people one of them's going to die 
you make the decision who who dies next and it's just you know it's that thing of like the wonderful sort of like excruciating pain that this character is going through uh, but the serial killer is doing it for a reason it's the fact that you know these this guy is a bartender because uh, similar to zoe in that she's fallen off life's edge um because she didn't want to deal with it anymore and this this killer is trying to force them back into the into the world of the living by having to make these decisions over someone who's going to die and it's it's a relatively short book um but it is i think one of one Koontz is on you know on top form it is a is a wonderfully uh mean book to the reader oh good okay well we'll definitely look for that well julie i'm gonna jump in if that's okay and talk to you about my segment which is about being warped <laughs> excellent warped is the state of being twisted or bent out of shape it's also a mental or moral twist, aberration, or deviation. And wood has a tendency to warp, and so do people. In wood, warping is a result of stresses, and when it takes up moisture unevenly, and then that dries too slowly or too quickly, many factors contribute to wood warping. And there are different types of warping, bow, crook, kink, cup, twist. There's a similar effect with people. It takes a true author artist to skillfully paint the picture of a warped character for readers. Motivations, emotions, and circumstances hit these characters differently than with a person who hasn't been warped that way by life. As the author, you can't just throw out a pile of seemingly irrational actions by the villain. You, to me, I think you have to show the layers of warping and how over time the stresses have impacted a character with twisting and deviation. Then reveal the tension within as different warped factors compound. Simon Wood is a master at painting villains. Take the example of Steven in Terminator. As a reader, I feel that I understand what's caused the character's deviation. I want to sympathize with him for what life has dealt him. And then he does something villainous and I'm outraged. My sympathy disappears because no matter what he's been through, I feel emotionally that he has no right to inflict this pain on others. The author masterfully stirs up this conflict within me, the reader. I want to sympathize. It's right to have empathy for what this villain has internalized, but I can't condone this. Now I'm dealing not only with conflict on the page, but truly within myself. Now that's a villain who's truly a worthy opponent. And that's a powerful story that really sticks with you. What do you think about that, Julie? Good point. And I'm going to talk just briefly about the other side of warped. And I took your word warped to heart. Yes, it does mean bent out of shape, but it also sometimes means reshaped or reformed into something more interesting or unexpected. And I know this happens in nature, especially with trees. I'm thinking of some of the trees in Monterey and along the California coast. But I'm talking about writers and readers here and how the process of writing changes us or warps us perhaps as readers certainly none of us would be writers without the early gift of reading or having someone read to us and usually reading in vast amounts sometimes even reading things that weren't good for us things that warped us Simon spoke earlier about the way watching old black and white films as a youngster shaped him into writing about horror stories. And I'm thinking of all those medical and surgical journals my uncle let me read when I was 14. I went back to an old favorite of mine. It's a book called Telling Lies for Fun and Profit by writer Lawrence Block, where he talked about this very thing. He's a two-time Edgar Award winner and won a host of other mystery-related awards in the industry as well. He's an old pro. He's been at it a long time. And he talked about how he read on two levels, that of someone purely enjoying the story on a basic level, and how he also read with the writer's eye open. 
usually where he noticed something really well written. It's a more analytical way of reading, noticing what works and what doesn't, perhaps even indulging in some mental revisions or rewriting. He compared it to a musician at a concert, sitting in the audience, following along with a musical score. And this is something I've seen my brother Chris do many times. I'm told this can heighten a musician's enjoyment of what they hear by being sensitive to the nuances and special emphasis that other performers put on a piece of music. So when I read an exceptional piece of fiction, whatever it is, my awareness and appreciation is enhanced, including some elements I might have missed if I weren't reading it as a writer. I'll sum it up by saying that sometimes being warped is a good thing. It forces you to pay attention and by virtue of that act to reshape yourself into a better and more discerning writer. Now, before we start Wendy's book recommendation, please enjoy a special audio version of the beginning of Terminated from SoundCloud. Buckle your seatbelts. Chapter 1 You're enjoying this, aren't you? Gwen tasted Tarbell's bitterness from across her desk. She'd made a mistake. She'd feared Tarbell's performance review would turn adversarial, or to be more exact, that Tarbell himself would turn adversarial. Now she'd incited him. She knew it wouldn't take much to set him off, and she blamed herself for this unpleasant turn of events. She thought if she cataloged his positive traits before his shortcomings, it wouldn't sound so bad. A spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down and all that. Now she saw the glaring error of her approach. It looked to him as if she'd built him up, only to slap him down. She should have given it to him straight. No doubt the direct approach would have still drawn his ire, but it also would have gotten the issue out in the open earlier. Steve, it's not like that. Steven. Only my friends call me Steve. Gwen trod carefully. She couldn't be seen kowtowing to Tarbell on this point. If she began calling him Steven and it got around the water cooler that he had insisted on it, it would make her look weak. She'd never had Tarbell's respect, but she couldn't afford to lose the respect of her other subordinates. At the same time, she had to respect his wishes. For now, she wouldn't call him anything. This isn't personal. He leaned back in his seat, crossed his arms and legs, and twisted his mouth into a sneer. <sighs> Isn't it? No, it's not. I have to follow strict criteria for performance evaluations. I couldn't make it personal even if I wanted to. Bullshit. The expletive split the air like a gunshot. Gwen glanced outside her office. The outburst hadn't caught anyone's ear. Steve, that's enough. Steven, he corrected. It was on the tip of her tongue to tell him to grow up, but she bit the remark back. She'd only be perpetuating his juvenile behavior. This review was on the verge of getting away from her. If she followed Tarbell down this road, it would speak more to her poor management skills than to his shortcomings. She paused to give them both a moment to cool off. Tarbell uncurled his long-limbed body, leaned forward, and pressed a fist down on the edge of the desk. Gwen fought the urge to back away. Why don't we cut the crap and be honest for a second? We both know why you're doing this. You want me out because you know I should have gotten the promotion instead of you. I have more experience and seniority. What do you have? <laughs> Nothing. But they still gave you the job. Call it affirmative action or sexual equality or equal opportunity employment. But you only got the job because you're a woman. I should be sitting in that seat, not you. I should be telling you that you failed to meet the standards expected of this company. Christ, what a joke. Well, I think that's definitely given our listeners a taste of what they have to look forward to in this book. <laughs> My book recommendation for this episode is Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. In this book, the handsome man, Maxim, 
is staying at the same hotel as the heroine and her employer. And after knowing the heroine only briefly, he proposes marriage. She accepts, and he marries her and takes her back to his ancestral estate of Mandalay. But a dark cloud hangs over their marriage. Maxim's first wife, Rebecca, drowned in a cove near Mandalay the previous year, and her ghost haunts the newlyweds' home. Rebecca's devoted housekeeper, the sinister Mrs. Danvers, is still in charge of Manderley, and she sets out on a campaign to frighten and intimidate this unexpected new mistress. The campaign is very effective. The young, impressionable bride feels she can never compare favorably to Rebecca, who must have been beautiful, talented, and brilliant, or so she's been told. And soon she becomes afraid that her new husband is still in love with his dead wife. As events unfold and Mrs. Danvers continues to turn the psychological crank of the rack she's put the heroine on, the heroine becomes convinced that Maxim will never love her, that he's still devoted to Rebecca. Mrs. Danvers' actions bring the heroine to the brink of suicide. The mystery that ensues is riveting. Oh, the mind games that people can inflict. Julie, what's your book recommendation this episode? Well, for this episode, my recommendation is The English Girl by Daniel Silva. And it's another stellar work in his series featuring Gabriel Alon, who is a gifted art restorer, assassin, and Israeli spy. This is a big book of over 500 pages, which roves over a vast part of Europe and the Middle East. From London's 10 Downing Street to Jerusalem to Corsica, with stops in France and Moscow. It's the story of bad people doing bad things at very high levels. And it all starts with a young woman. Madeline Hart is a young rising star in British government, beautiful, ambitious, and the secret lover of the British Prime Minister. Off on a short vacation to sunny Corsica, she's kidnapped by someone who knows about the relationship and plans to make the Prime Minister pay dearly. Fearing scandal, the PM decides not to involve the police and brings in an expert, Gabriel Alon, who must find Madeline in seven short days before her kidnappers kill her online and publicize all the dirty details. There's edge-of-the-seat tension throughout, more deadly secrets to be exposed, and considerable violence and a series of unreliable, provocative characters. And remember, nothing is what it seems in this book, and you won't see this one coming. As the author depicts it, much of the espionage manipulation aimed at the United Kingdom and the United States in this novel is financed by Russia's energy petroleum oligarchy. So be sure to read the author's note at the end of the book for more insights into how fiction mirrors reality. Silva's done an incredible job of tracing the pathways of power and what happens when flawed human beings make selfish decisions. As Maureen Corrigan of NPR said in her review, Silva writes spy novels for people who are willing to think about uncomfortable political questions and the ongoing history of human brutality. I must add that there's also wit, elegance, and subtlety in his writing, along with the prerequisite weapons and tradecraft. I highly recommend it. And I think that's a wrap for this edition of Kendall and Cooper Talk Mysteries. Wendy and I would sincerely like to thank our special guest, author Simon Wood, for speaking with us today, especially when he's working on a hot and heavy deadline. And we're truly looking forward to your next two books. Thanks again, and keep writing. Thank you, Simon. Thanks. Thanks. 